That was, that was a really impressive bio that I wrote for myself, I gotta say. <laughs> Which I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, God, I've done this stuff dozens of times, but I'm still incredibly nervous. So, um, there was a, a, a TV and a satellite dish got married, right? Uh, the, the, the wedding ceremony was eh, but the reception was fantastic. <laughs> okay, I'm limbered up now, all right. So yeah, I am, all about, I am all about thinking that our gardens and our landscapes, we have an ethical and even a moral imperative to be uh, designing and making gardens and landscapes, uh, be able to sustain wildlife and as a result, us in the future, right? We do have a sixth mass extinction going on right now. Don't invite me to parties, I'm a real downer. Um, and we're causing it. Go to the Lincoln Children's Zoo just for this. Okay, that's the title of my talk, but you know, whatever. So I am going to try and show you activism while I'm standing up here. I'm not so much going to talk about directly about what I do and strategies. I'm going to show you what I do. This is my 1,500-foot garden in my backyard. This is where my activism started. It started through experience. So whatever you're passionate about, do it. Find a way to do it. Find a way to make it happen. This is what it looks like in spring. This is what it looks like in July. 75% native plants to Nebraska, celebrating our cultural history, supporting biodiversity, supporting pollinators and wildlife. We have to get away from landscapes that are lawn focused and chemical focused. We have lawns that you know, you see Scots driving around town all the time spraying crap all over the place. You smell it, you breathe it in, it gives you cancer, it's terrible for our watershed. It makes weird monarch butterfly swallowtail hybrids that can't possibly exist in nature, but they do when they visit Scots lawns, right? We need to be celebrating gardens in the wintertime, too. Too often we're cutting back our gardens because we want this manicured, clean look, right? Everything's got to be in its place, but this is wildlife habitat. This is life. This is our life in action in our landscapes. So there's more than one species on the planet. It's not just us. A designed landscape that does not see beyond the human is a landscape that is devoid of the human. It's devoid of forgiveness, mercy, hope, equality, and community. We're all in this planet together. We are all equal. Mountains, rivers, monarch butterflies, slugs, even mosquitoes, I'm afraid to say. I guess I get my initial inspiration from my mother's garden growing up. Um, she dragged me to nurseries all the time, which turns out to be a wonderful benefit. Don't tell her that. Uh, she used gardens during her childhood. She went to her grandparents' garden as a way to escape an abusive uh, stepfather. So I think that was, that's how we treat gardens and landscapes and nature, a place to escape to. And that's okay, but there's so much more than that, right? They're healing for us and healing for other species. So when I moved to Nebraska to do my PhD, my mom looks at my townhouse, looks at the lawn and says, no, get in the truck, we're going to a nursery. So we got some plants, put them in there, and this was the first four years of my gardening life, like 50 square feet of plants, right? But this is, you know, you, you, you get your feet wet. You, you, you dip your toes into the waters of uncertainty and change. And this is what my garden looked like, the main garden in the first year, in 2007, that my wife and I had a big truck dump 20 yards of mulch. If, if you know what 20 yards of mulch is, it basically, well, it doesn't fill up this auditorium, but it feels like it. We spread it by hand. And then the plants came. The plants grew, right? The flowers came. The flowers are beautiful, you know, fulfilling life systems uh, for everything. And then these guys came. Now, I bought, they're chewing on, these are monarch caterpillars chewing on milkweed. I didn't know that at the time. I simply bought milkweed because there was a butterfly on the plant tag and I wanted butterflies in my garden. So I see these guys on here, I'm thinking, oh my God, no. They're destroying what I spent $10 on at the nursery. Halfway to the garage, getting my poisons, and I think, maybe I should go Google this. So this is when my life changed. I realized that I can support life out back, and they came and they found me. My milkweed brings all the monarchs to the yard. Damn right. Oh, what do you, you know? You sing it to yourself. I, I missed the line. <laughs> milkweed brings all the monarchs to the yard. Well, how does it, you know how it goes. <laughs> they put me in the middle of liven it up tonight, right? I don't know. This is why you don't invite me to parties. 50% 50, 50 of U.S. birds uh, are going to face extinction by 2100, uh, climate change and habitat loss. One third of all plants may be gone by mid-century. These are plants across the entire planet. 96% of songbirds feed insects to the young, and native plants support 30 times the number of insects than exotic plants. Most of our plants in our gardens and landscapes are brought here from Asia and Europe, and they share no evolutionary history with the wildlife. Therefore, they are junk. 70% of U.S. grasslands may be gone by 2100. Very sad. No, I get more than two minutes. 
prairie saves lives, people. It really does. This is, what, this is what the extent of the, what the prairie used to be, what the Great Plains used to be, that dark green area and then the lesser light green. This is what it is now. The dark green is what's left. Everything else is pretty much not really working for us. You can see the beautiful sand hills and the flint hills in Kansas. It's very sad to me. I mean, look at the sand hills. They're gorgeous. Wonderful environment, wonderful ecosystem. We have, we have more ecosystems in this state than from the eastern Nebraska all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. We are an incredibly divert, biodiverse state with so much to, to treasure and foster. Look at Nine Mile Prairie up in northwest Lincoln. Gorgeous blue stem that seeds feed wildlife. Look at, uh, at Spring Creek Prairie down in Denton at, sun, at, sun, at sunset. Beautiful for us, beautiful for wildlife. Kids today see 35% fewer butterflies than their parents did 40 years ago. What are your grandkids going to see? They're going to see about nothing if we keep doing stuff like this. This is, this is, a, you know, th th this is acreage somewhere in Lincoln, near, near where I live, <clears throat> that it's not me. We're, sit we're sitting here saying with these lawn landscapes, we are the dominant species. Everything we think is right, and nothing else matters. So here I am, boom, very myopic, unfortunately. We drive around Lincoln and we see landscapes like this. This is terrible, this is depressing. Actually, this really pisses me off. It's not beautiful to me, it's not doing, it's not, it's not sequestering carbon, it's not filtering ground, groundwater, it's not providing habitat for butterflies or bees or anything else. There's no reason this has to be lawn and it costs many, many more times to have this than a native landscape. We have a county that is obsessive about mowing roadside edges. There's a growing movement right now in this country about not mowing roadside edges, especially on highways and interstates. This is habitat for all kinds of wildlife, butterflies and bees and all that wonderful stuff. But we mow way too often. This stuff is sequestering carbon. There's actually a study that I read recently that said the higher you leave your, your roadside edges, um, the less likely it is deer are going to come across. So when you mow, you're actually saying, hey, deer, come on, there's fresh forage right here, eat it, and get hit by a car. It'd be wonderful if one side of our state capitol would celebrate our heritage, having prairie, design prairie garden, or just seeding a prairie. I think that would be fantastic for people to see that example, to know where we come from and where we still very much are and should be in the future. We have to rethink pretty. Gardens, landscapes, this world, it's not just pretty for us, it's pretty for everything else. Here's one of our native plants, Rattlesnake Master. It's pretty to 140 different species of pollinators. Incredibly beneficial plant. Here's another one I think is pretty, and 180 species of pollinators think is gorgeous. Purple prairie clover, you'll find it in prairies everywhere. We have to rethink pretty in our winter landscapes because these, they're, they're going to be spiders and butterflies hibernating in leaf litter and, and dead stems and stuff. Beautiful. C come over to my house, man, sometime. Let's party, okay? <laughs> oh, I can't read this from here. I'm coming over here. Native plants are the top of a much larger iceberg and represent more than aesthetic value. And maybe that's the problem, too, because talking about gardens is not just a refuge from trouble, but the heart of trouble, a reflection of larger issues we can change, is uncomfortable, and it should be. We don't want our gardens to be statements for anything but personal pleasure. We don't want our gardens to be influenced by the world out there. Our gardens are not insular little worlds, though, and gardens and managed landscapes are not just for us. To assume they are is racism toward other species. That's pretty radical. It's gotten me into a lot of trouble with international landscape designers and architects who are incredibly famous and rich. Oh, well, c'est la vie, huh? <laughs> pretty to me, pretty to wildlife. That's my backyard garden in fall. Asters supporting lots of pollinators and are migrating through in the fall. Pretty to me, my backyard, pretty to other wildlife. Pretty to these guys, native bee kissing a, a, an ant on a pasque flower. Hey, love for everybody, man. <laughs> Here's a bumblebee. Pretty, pretty. Hummingbird on native blue sage. Moths. Monarch butterflies, of course. We need to design landscapes that are self-sustaining. We need to design landscapes that encourage biodiversity planted thickly and sequester carbon and filter our rainwater. We need to have signs in these installations in these places, both public and private gardens, that say what these places are doing, why they're doing, why they're so important to all of us. We need to rethink our front yards, too. Why does it have to be lawn? This is my front yard, by the way. I'm just showing you everything I do. Uh, you know, why does it have to be lawn? Why can't it be something pretty? Why can't it be something functional, something that celebrates who we are? All right, I think this is my last really wordy slide. How many minutes over am I? 
Uh, your garden is a protest. This is my garden ethics philosophy. Your garden is a protest. It is a place of defiant compassion. That space is one to help sustain wildlife and ecosystem function while providing an aesthetic response that moves you. For you, beauty isn't pedal deep, but goes down to the soil, further down into the aquifer, and back up into the air, and for miles around on the backs and legs of insects. You don't have to see soil microbes in action, birds eating seeds, butterflies laying eggs, ants farming aphids. Just knowing it's possible in your garden thrills you. It's like faith, and it frees you to live life more authentically. Your garden is a protest for all the ways in which we deny our life by denying other lives. Plant some natives. Be defiantly compassionate. I'm going to channel Audre Lorde here right at the end, right? What you hear in my voice tonight, maybe I was joking, but it's not anger. I mean, it's anger. It's not suffering. It's fury, not moral authority. Go out there, make a difference, and plant some native plants, please, for me. Thank you. Thank you.